So hello everybody and uh, it's nice that you've joined us this morning. I'm here with the iconic rowing figure, legendary Sir Matt Pinsent and um, we're going to be chatting about all things rowing. Catch us live with some questions. I'm sure people will join as we go along. Um, but uh, if you're watching this afterwards, I hope you enjoy the interview. Now, um, Matt, it's a big, big uh, week for Henley Regatta this week, isn't it? Yes. So uh, I think as of two minutes ago, our plans for this year, such as they are, went live. Um, obviously, it's, you know, we took the decision months ago to cancel. There's no racing. There's no event. There's nothing happening on site. Uh, but Henley at home uh, went live um, two days or two minutes ago. And over the last couple of days, uh, I've been filming um, some stuff with coaches and competitors from the last four or five years and talking to them about some of their races. Uh, I know we've roped you and uh, Jess Eddy in to rerun some races. Uh, and that we're going to we're gonna package up a sort of weekend of YouTube coverage. Uh, Saturday is going to be sort of race reruns and re-commentary and uh, re-analysis. And then Sunday, we're going to have a sort of uh, the best of the uh, last five years finals, which we've obviously got as our archive and we've picked uh, the best in each event. So we'll have a sort of dream lineup of uh, uh, 24 finals uh, on Sunday. And then there'll be a lunch break on each day because it wouldn't be Henley without a lunch break. <laughs> Um, and we've got some uh, hampers that people can buy, and they, you know, got some lovely, uh, lovely food if you want to order that up. And obviously, uh, people are going to be at home. People might be in the garden. Hopefully, the weather is going to be good on that weekend, and we can have some sort of uh, marking of Henley weekend um, because, you know. It's it's all we can do this year. It's sort of the the as everyone is experiencing the rowing calendar and every other calendar has been sort of eviscerated this this summer. Are you allowed to say who the who the guests are that you've got, Matt? So uh, I need I interviewed five. Uh, so we've got Phelan Hill, who obviously uh, cocks the GB men's eight to a gold medal in Rio. Uh, one of the races, and he said uh, that his Henley win in the Grand in 2015 was one of his top three races. Uh, Lisa Sheenard from the Netherlands, sculler and winner of the Princess Royal. Uh, she's uh, She's been great. I spoke to her yesterday. Uh, Mahe Drysdale I spoke to, although uh, I think you've been interviewing some Kiwis in the last few weeks. The time change makes that quite complicated. Yeah. But he, yeah. was, he was charming and, and lovely as ever. Uh, who have I got left? Bobby Thatcher, uh, who coached the St Paul's crews in the last four or five years, been talking wow. to him. And who's, yes, uh, Yaz Farouk, uh, who is the chief women's coach at UW. Um, who came both with Stanford in her time there and then more recently with UW um, and has said very publicly that um, she wants to come and bring a crew to Henley every every four years um, because she thinks it's a great experience and um, wants to make that promise to her athletes going forward. So it's been, uh, it's been quite an intense uh, couple of days of filming and now it goes into the edit and then uh, it'll be ready uh, for Henley weekend. And so I, I guess it'd be great if people were, you know, they could get the dust their blazers off and put them on and um, and get out in the garden with their families or extended Yeah, I, mean, I think we already know from social media that that sort of thing um, is people have already been saying we're going to do that anyway. Um, and so it's nice to have a sort of um, sense of community, even remote, um, and I hope that lockdown for us in the UK sort of lifts a little bit more in the next two weeks and that we can get to see more people and host more people in our gardens than, than the, the current rules allow. Um, but yes, that sort of thing about, oh, I want to put the I want to put the blazer on. I want to open a bottle of champagne. I want to have a picnic. I want to 
um, mark the mark the weekend or mark the day. Um, and the other thing that we made a little um, sort of montage, we're hoping to make a montage of, is the is the row past cruise, because I think we had fourteen crews or clubs that were going to do row pass this year, and so that's all gone. So they don't, at least this year, they'll all be invited back next year. But if you're celebrating 150 years as a club, having a row pass in your 151st year is a yeah, it's not it, it's these small things you think you think oh it'll be yeah. fine but as the as the landmarks of the rowing summer sort of slowly slip past you really miss them yeah it's been a strange old summer hasn't it really and um mm. did, did you get any um any surprises talking to any of those guests i, I know mahe sort of come out quite publicly at the beginning of lockdown and said he kind of almost felt a bit broken and demotivated so yeah he said that to me. He said he said that they had uh, four weeks or five weeks of complete lockdown, and he lost his mojo. I think everybody did from that that elite end, active end of the uh, of the sport. Um, Lisa Sheenard said the same in the Netherlands, um, and then and then they got back out onto the water, and uh, and then it was like, right, okay, back into it. And maybe we've got an advantage here because we're coming back out sooner, which of course New Zealand are. Um, but then, you know, it, 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 the, the, the deadline of the Olympics moving by a year for a guy his age, I think he would have been 41 and now he would will be 42. Um, and he said rather sweetly, he said, well, I was going to break the record for being the oldest... <laughs> gold medal at 41 and now I'm just going to have to do it at 42 and that'll be a record too. Um, but interestingly, you know, he was very respectful and, and sort of cognizant, not only of that record, but also talking about his diamonds wins and the combination of the winning the grand and the, the single that he tried last year. Um, you know, it was sort of, it, it, these, these things were important. And actually what he said to me at the end is that actually now the, the, the virus and having the Olympics moved and sort of everything under threat has sort of re reinvigorated himself because, oh, wow. well, you'd be completely forgiven at, at that age for saying I'm, I'm done. And lots of people have very understandably, you know, like it just, it's, it's just a tough time for everyone in the sport, particularly with the, with the Olympics being shifted, it's um, it's tough. Although I have to say, I think that of course that's the right decision to move it. I don't think they had any other choice. Um, and I was very very at the time that, that the IOC got that call wrong to begin with. Actually, yeah. Can you see the Olympics happening next next year with with all the sort of second spikes and that kind of stuff going on? I think. I mean, it's still in the balance, isn't it? I think I think without uh, um, uh, you know what am I trying to say? What's the right word? Not not an inoculation. Um, vaccination. Uh, thank you. Without a vaccination, I think it'll it'll uh, it'll be really tough. It'll be really tough. I think I think um, the idea of hundreds of thousands of people traveling from all around the world to concentrate in one place. Well, now that's just unthinkable. Um, and then the next stage might be, you know, I can I can see how you know you can see how football is beginning to start up with quite strict health protocols about the competitors. So would they countenance uh, an Olympics in empty stadia uh, with no spectators um, and only a minimum of uh, media? I mean, possibly. Um, it, it it wouldn't it, it wouldn't be the Olympics as per usual, but it might be that or nothing, and I think that's a that's a really difficult call, another really difficult call for the IOC, um, yeah. and I think, think that's probably got to be made around the turn of the year, don't you think? You can't be telling athletes with less than six months, eight months to go, uh, yes, it's on or no, it's not or whatever. I think it's really tough. And I guess Henley for next year doesn't have to make a decision until what sort of March, April well, time. We're just beginning to map that out now. Uh, we're just beginning to put a timeline in for next spring. 
to be saying this is these are the these are the deadlines because you know even this year's decision uh which we took in march um you know ended up well, we're losing money um that's that's no surprise um but if we'd if we tried to keep the option longer it would have cost us increasing amounts of money and the and the 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 problem for us is we've got no infrastructure there's not a stadium sitting there empty waiting for us to come and row everything has to be built on site as you know and that build starts in late march um and that was the that was the 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 trigger really for us to say right we've got to got to say this is this year we've got to say now whether we're going to ask the contractors and some of our employees some of the staff uh to go onto site and start putting up uh tents and boat tents and start moving things around um and it was you know as a committee we were meeting remotely so we weren't as a committee we had taken a risk a risk assessment that we didn't want to meet remotely we wouldn't be that was a risk that we weren't prepared to take and then we were suddenly saying well if we say yes or even starting this we're going to be asking our staff not to work from home because they need to be on site and at that point as hard and as uh, big as the decision felt, I don't think in the end it was, um, you know, we didn't really have a choice. I, I just, and it would have been, you know, e even if we'd said yes that week, a week later, it would have been, you know, uh, you know it would have been terrible. So, so yeah. it was with heavy hearts, but I don't think that we really had any choice. Now, Matt, I'm going to take you back to an incident in your past. Talk about your rowing career. We we, we chatted about this earlier, but um, it, it became very famous from the, the Gold Fever documentary about your four with um, Steve, Tim and, and James. Um, yeah. With you racing at Henley. And uh, very famous race against the Australians. It's a great race. One of my favourite Henley races. Saturday afternoon, that was uh i think it was 98 oh now you've shared all your screen yeah can you see that picture is that right tiny it's tiny 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 oh, i will go and do it a different way then okay yeah. i have a feeling i know what you're doing you're going to put a picture of me putting my hand in the air yeah <laughs> just talk us through that matt so I'm struggling to remember the year. I'm fairly sure it was 98 because, um, yes, they were still together as a four. Or they were coming back together as a four in 98. 97, the Aussies had had a year off, as, as was their habit at that point. They used to take a break, big break after the Olympics. So 97, there was a field without an australian four or certainly the awesome foursome from 96 were absent we won the world championships in egg Ballet, and then they said they were coming to henley in 98 and it was saturday afternoon uh we had as you can see we had the berkshire station and they had bucks and it was a big thing it was a it was yeah. a big moment because it felt like, look, if we're serious about this unit uh, winning in Sydney um, and Steve's methodology throughout his career was to beat everyone as often as you can on every chance you can, um, then them coming to our home regatta, our home water was quite a statement from them. Um, and uh, it was a huge race. It was a huge race. And I think it was about the only... Henley race where we've been supported from the first stroke until the last. I mean, I've, I've rode uh, many years with Steve, particularly in the early rounds of the goblets. And uh, you, you, you don't quite get booed, but you, you know, in the early stages and certainly past Remenham, you get slightly jeered by, uh, by rowing with pink blades there. Um, and, uh, and that race, it was, it was, yeah, it was just a sort of absolutely classic toe-to-toe -to -toe race. And then, yeah, I've got my hand up there saying that we won. 
<laughs> we haven't crossed the finish line. Was that an impulsive gesture or was it... Yeah, totally. Totally. Totally impulsive. Totally impulsive. Um, and I think, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting challenge about what, what I would say now as a... Uh, as uh, as an umpire, and I know exactly who was umpiring that race. It was Mike Sweeney because was it? he did, yeah, yeah, yeah. He did exactly what I think I would do now as an umpire, which is you don't say anything to the crew <coughs> because um, I don't. I just don't think you know it doesn't affect the outcome of the race, and it doesn't have a uh you know it, it wouldn't wouldn't change the the race and whilst we do have an unsportsmanlike i'm looking for a rule book here whilst we do have a um sort of unsportsmanlike rule now which it probably would fall foul of um i think i would i would say to the coach as they got out of the launch okay that's that's one i'll have pretended not to notice yeah. that and let's not have that tomorrow when they race the final yeah uh, which I think is what Mike said to Jürgen. Yeah, I just want to talk to you about, um, you know, you mentioned Rowan with Steve, um, but just a little aside question. We've got um, Sibren Visser, who's watching this on, on YouTube, and he's asked um, if the extra day that I, Henley added to its programme will still go ahead. Yes, uh, the plan, um, the plan very much is that next year will will be as twenty twenty one was always planned. Um, so the twenty twenty rollout was going to be five days um, with a program not dissimilar to last year because um, we whilst we had a new event uh, planned for twenty twenty. That is the uh, Ireland Trophy, which is women's student university cruise. Um, so, so that would that would happily go into the program because last year we had the Kings Cup. Yeah. So, whilst it was creaking at the seams, you'll remember last year the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday were just early starts, late finishes, uh, race every five minutes. It's absolutely packed and and. You know, we we've known for a while that the only way to really expand uh, the regatta significantly is to, to to get more racing slots. So, 2020 would have been student women's uh, eights uh, this year. That of course will happen next year, but it'll also be the debut year for junior women's eights uh, and club women's eights as well. So we'll have, and the only way to get all those away is to have the the sixth day so we'll start on tuesday i can't remember off the top of my head uh the date um but qualifying won't move from the friday before um and we hope steve the chairman is uh is hopeful that the days will be a little bit more manageable in length so instead of having uh three absolutely enormous tiring days wednesday thursday friday We'll have four slightly shorter days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, and then the weekend, actually, you, we can manage the extra semi-final day because you're only then down to whatever it would be, uh, 50 races or something. And then, of course, the, um, uh, the final day will be by then 26, I think. 26 will be next year. Um, all of which, you know, we're very hopeful. I mean, that's the that's the plan. That's the trajectory, which is really exciting. Now, now you get very close relationships in sport, and I can see behind you, you've got the names of Cracknell and Pinson and Redgrave and Pinson, which I'm, I'm interested where they come from, actually. <laughs> it's another Henley link. Uh, so uh, sort of part of my lockdown morning for the rowing season uh, and doing lots of Zoom calls, I thought a plain wall is quite boring. So I built a sort of Roman shrine, and it, it it basically ended up being quite. I mean, I've got other, I've got other sort of uh, rowing memorabilia and you know significant bit, bits and bobs. Um, but these two are the plastic. Uh, let me just, without knocking anything off. Here we go. So you'll know uh, that the progress boards at Henley uh, have the names of the crews that slide along on the... Oh, uh, uh, yeah. 
Awards and one of the older uh, uh, generation of stewards, uh, Angus, um, came up to me uh, at the end of my time, in fact, with James. So this is uh, 2003, I think, was our last Henley. I don't think, oh, well, in my last Henley with, with James in the pair was 2003. And he said, look, I, I made a point when you finished with Steve of taking the progress board sign for you and Steve away and keeping it safe. And I've done the same with yours and James. Uh, and I think you'd like to have them. Um, and they've been in the loft for years and years. And then I suddenly thought, oh, actually, that would be quite a good way of filling some wall space behind me. So I don't have, uh, I don't have many posh books. Uh, well, I've got a Steve's book or something up there. Um, uh, and a sort of uh, background to all my Zoom calls full of rowing bits and bobs. Yeah.